Welcome to Celebrating Act Two, where today John and I are going to be speaking with Dr. Liz Lister, who always has something interesting for us to explore and help improve our health. Dr. Liz, you're just the woman I wanted to see today. Wonderful. Um, I went to my doctor for a, a checkup uh, mm. recently, and he took me off a, a, a drug. He said, he said it was great 20 years ago. He said, I got a new drug. It's better. You'll take less of it. It mm -hmm. works better. You're going to be happier. And, uh, and I, I was flabbergasted. It doesn't matter to me. It's just another pill, you know. But right. I was flabbergasted because it was right in my face, the, the, the idea that the pharmaceutical industry is constantly coming up with mm. new and improved um, medicines, if you will. Uh, right. It's amazing. Right. We, we're we're yeah. very lucky in the modern era. Yes, it is very amazing. It's a very detailed process. It's a very long process. Uh, there are no guarantees when a group of researchers or at a company pursue developing a new drug or medication, uh, there are no guarantees and they're embarking on a very complex process. It's a very interesting process. Yeah, I'll bet it is. And as you point out, it's it's time consuming and I'm sure it's very expensive. That's right. Too. But That's right. where does it begin? Where do they begin? I mean, in my case, it was replacing an older drug with something that's works better, yes. you know, yes. but exactly. sometimes there, there are drugs that come out that nobody ever heard of, you know, things, That's they right. do things that you never thought of. That's right. That's exactly right. Where it usually starts is thinking about the cause of an illness, either the cause of a symptom or the cause of a disease. And mm -hmm. when they think about the cause, so for example, heart disease, and you think about blood flow to the heart, Right. Yeah. And so you think, well, how can I improve the blood flow to the heart? So it was the late 1980s in the United Kingdom where a couple of researchers created a drug that specifically targeted a particular way that the blood flow increases, that dilate blood vessels and that they hoped would help lower blood pressure and help with angina, the pain that some people have uh, when they're dealing with chronic heart illnesses. So they created this drug and that's literally in a laboratory to target that one process in the body. And then they did, so that's the first part is drug development. The second is what they call preclinical trials. And they, what they do is they try out, when they get to the point where they have something in a pill form or in a way that can be given to a person, they test it in healthy volunteers. So they tested this particular drug in healthy volunteers, usually men, this is something that's improving, is including women and people of all ages in clinical trials. But back at this point, they were leaving women out of these trials a lot. And so this was tried out in men and those men in these small preclinical trials, these healthy volunteers, they didn't have any effect. They didn't feel any changes in blood pressure significantly, but they did report the onset of spontaneous erections. <laughs> and this is how Viagra was discovered. <laughs> Wait, like post-it notes, like post-it notes, it's an accident. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's the same where the adhesive didn't really work as bonding as it was supposed to, but now we have the wonderful technological advance of post-it notes. So that is how that happened. And of course, the drug companies moved very quickly uh, to get it patented in the 90s. Uh, and then it took until it took about another 10 years until it was FDA approved uh, in the United States. So it's a very interesting process, not a typical process to have something that was being researched for one purpose give a different result. That happens relatively often, but not to be that dramatic and become this kind of blockbuster uh, medication. There are stories like that, but it's yeah. not the typical story. <laughs> so there's those are the first two of the four phases. 
after the preclinical trials, then there are the clinical trial section and develop in, in the process of drug development. And the last part, the fourth, is the whole FDA process. It's a huge, huge process. Uh, it involves reviewing everything that has happened up until then, the quality of the studies, the quality of the data, approving the drug, and post-marketing safety monitoring. So even after a drug comes on the market, the FDA is still involved with post-launch safety monitoring of that medication. And that goes on. Yeah. That, that goes on uh, for a long time. So those are the four phases. So uh, let me ask you a system. question. I, let me ask you a question if I can. Um, a lot of people in our audience take warfarin or a blood thinner of some kind. And there are lots of reasons for it. But uh, warfarin used to be the thing. And then all of a sudden, about five or six years ago, probably in development for 10 to 15 years, there was a whole bunch of substitutes where you didn't have to get a test every month and you didn't have to worry about the dosage or anything else. Like, I think one of them is called Eliquis. There are a couple of them out there uh, to replace them. Is that, a, is that a, a, an example that we could all think of? of uh, it's not even a, a, something yes. that wasn't being addressed. It was already being addressed, but people were trying to figure out pharmaceuticals, how to do it better. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. Competitors. Mm. Uh, and that, that's absolutely correct. Especially once the mechanism is identified, mm. then other companies can develop other drugs. And that's how we come to have different drugs in the same category as you were describing. Now, also, I'd the like to ask, is, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'd also uh, like if you could address the, uh, the development sometimes is 5, 10, 15 years. But uh, with COVID, we right. found out that they, they, they applied a process to actually come up with vaccines right. very quickly. So is that changing the way we're developing uh, drugs and making them available to treat diseases? Yes, absolutely. The, the cost is so significant. It costs at minimum a million dollars to do a drug development process in the United States. Uh, in other parts of the world, it's a lot less expensive. However, the FDA is very very high standards of what data they will accept, that they will accept in the whole process. And so what we're seeing now is a lot of, well, there's always room for improvement, but we're seeing collaboration. We're seeing the FDA get involved earlier in the process so that the trials can be developed correctly. The worst thing for a medication is for the trials to be conducted and then the FDA will go in and say, no, you should have done this or that differently in the trial. So there's more consulting going on earlier on in the process. And to some extent, there's more worldwide collaboration so that it can be so that drugs could be developed in other parts of the world, but still have very, very high standards of excellence in the whole process so that we can have safe, effective medications to use for illnesses and for prevention and, of course, for treatment and for what we've seen in the last few years, we've seen that process uh, really accelerate by way of this type of collaboration. Yeah, yeah you mentioned uh, other parts of the world. I take it that the FDA is the gold standard that everybody uh, needs to meet, but is the FDA, um, I know they're cognizant of it, are they willing to work with these other um, foreign entities, foreign hospitals or research labs or pharmaceutical companies. Yes. It, 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 so that we can move the process along. Absolutely. Yes, they are there. That's why I'm saying it. That's what I'm talking about, the collaboration that's happening, which I uh -huh. think is uh, going to ultimately benefit all of us. Yeah, hmm. absolutely. Yeah. But these blockbuster drug stories are not the usual. The usual is a very slow, very methodical process. A lot of uh, starts where it doesn't turn out to be a useful uh, or possibly even a safe drug and the whole process just has to be abandoned. That's a much more common, uh, a much more common story. Botox is another, one other blockbuster story where it was developed to treat an eye condition in which the eye, the little many, many eye muscles that we have 
uh, when you relax those muscles, the condition is improved. And then of course they realize a secondary effect on wrinkles in the face. Yeah. And, uh, and then we have another blockbuster, but that is not the common story. The, common, the much more common story is a very expensive, slow process. Uh, and we usually get to benefit from the, that whole process so that we have safe, effective uh, medicines and prevention. Mm. Well, it's an amazing, uh, we live in an amazing world and uh, thank God for all those people doing all that work. Uh, you know, quite frankly, it's it's a, a good part of the reason why we actually have an audience, because unlike our, our, our parents and grandparents and great grandparents, people are living longer, healthier lives and they're <laughs> living true. to be routinely in their 80s and 90s and beyond. Yep. Our grandchildren yep. are going to certainly without other intervening issues, uh, hoping uh, easily to, to reach 100 and beyond. And that's a good deal of it has to do with the treatment of diseases that used to, we never used yeah, to get because right. get, we died early. And now that we're get, getting older and we're getting some of them, we can overcome them. So a yeah. fascinating subject matter. Thank you. You're welcome. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.